I'm Doug Lehman. I've got my guest expert, Theo Gilbert Jameson. And today we're going to talk about a lot of topics. We're going to get into bad bosses, management, and what effective leaders do and how do they lead. So Theo, welcome. Thanks. It's great to be here. This is just a topic that I've had on my mind for quite a while. Um, because I do a lot of coaching. I do a lot of leadership training. So these are two things that I've been sharing with leaders quite a bit. So I'm eager to get started and talk about these two topics. Yeah, these two topics, you do a lot with executive coaching, leadership. And the one topic we're going to get into, let's just get into the, the negativity right now. Let's get that out of the way. Seven characteristics of a bad boss, bad bosses, and and, and why that topic and how does that relate to effective uh communication or lack of? Well, you know, sometimes leaders don't realize that they're a bad boss. Sometimes they think they're doing a good job. So this is kind of to highlight some, but sometimes they think they're doing a good job, but they can't figure out why employees aren't aligned, energized, motivated, why employees aren't um, engaged. And uh, what I find is that many times they just fall prey to what we call these Seven signs of a bad boss. Well, lay on mommy, lay on, lay some of these seven signs that we want to avoid when it comes to boss. And I may use the word management interchangeably. You can correct mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong, but let, mm -hmm. let's let's go. Let's let's get, let's get it started here. Okay, and I'd like to say too because whether you're talking about a boss, a leader, a manager, I was always taught early in my career that the difference between a manager and a leader is that. You manage tasks, you manage things, you lead people. So as a leader, often you should be doing both. Um, and boss is just another terminology that people use. They kind of think of it negatively these days. But um, so you're right, we will be using those. But let's jump right into them. So when we think about the seven signs of a bad boss, the first sign is that bad bosses have no clear goals. And that's always an indicator when I'm training or when I'm doing my coaching and I'll ask a boss, what's your vision or a leader or a manager? What's your vision for your team? What are your goals? This is a big one. What are your goals for the next 30 days, six months and 12 months? <laughs> now, exceptional leader is going to be able to say, well, in 30 days, I want to do this in six months. They've got it in their head because they're, they're visionary. They're thinking ahead. But a bad boss typically they have no goals, so people are confused. They don't know where they're going. And um, so, you know, unfortunately, the team doesn't know at the end of the road what the success will look like or what the expectations to gain success should look like. So the first sign of a bad boss is that they have no clear goals. No sense of direction, no goals, or or I, I would say mission or mission statement, maybe take it to another level. But the point is no goals. So it, it's in disarray of what the task is at hand. Maybe they're focused on one action at a time, but what's the big picture here? And I think leadership really comes into play with that. And we'll get more into that. Exactly. So again, when I'm coaching leaders and executives, sometimes they just don't know. They're so in the weeds that they forget that as a leader, you've got to be thinking out 30 days, 60 days, six months, a year from now, how will we measure success? So having those clear goals and making sure that they're just a few simple things that your team is aware of is extremely important. It is extremely important. So I know you've listed seven. I did my homework, seven signs of a bad boss. Let's get into a couple more. All right. Number two is that a, bass bo a bad boss, <laughs> a bad boss delivers poor or no communication. You know, those are the types of boss that um, they don't mind having you be clueless. I think sometimes that they feel that the intimidation of people not knowing what's going on makes them feel stronger as a boss. But what happens is that in not communicating clearly what the goals are, what the expectations are, what success should look like, you leave your team um, uninformed. Bad bosses typically don't see the value in one-on-one -on -one meetings, monthly departmental meetings. They don't see the value in daily team huddles. So for that reason, they either have no or poor communication. Well, you listed a lot of things there. You talked about uh, lack of communication was the sign, but you talked about action items like daily team huddles, 
and and planning planning we i keep going back to the word leadership being able to guide their employees a, a sense of direction more than mm -hmm. anything else mm -hmm. lay another one on me all right so on top of not having any clear goals so you don't have anything to communicate to people the next thing is that they do not hold people accountable and it's easy for them to turn a blind eye when uh, noncompliance happens and when people don't do the right things. And also, uh, it's easy for them to compromise within the workplace because people don't have any standards. There's no goals, no standards, there's no communication. Um, another thing about bad bosses is often they come across as being unapproachable. So, you know, not holding people accountable. Employees always tell me in my department, our leader doesn't hold us accountable or they don't hold people accountable. And what it does is it creates a lot of chaos within the team. I think accountability from a management perspective kind of goes both ways, though, in a, in a corporate culture, because the, the manager, managers aren't accountable, but the employees have to be accountable. And it all goes back to engagement and culture. When we get into leadership, I'm looking forward to tackling that. But uh, lay another one on me, another bad habit of all a, right. a bad boss. Let's move on to number four. And I'm looking down at my notes because these are really great. I don't want to forget any of them. Bad bosses often blame others. They do a lot of finger pointing, finding it easy to blame other departments, to blame ineffective systems, processes, and even their team. But while they're pointing, you know, you've heard the term while you're pointing one finger at a person, you got four going back at you. Often the finger pointing uh, is um, irrelevant because with bad bosses, a lot of times, if there's a problem within the department, it's really, it rests on their shoulder. What processes do they have in place or don't have in place to remedy and close those gaps so that you don't have those issues? So no clear goals, no communication, no accountability. They blame others. Seems like that's enough, right? <laughs> well, if you, if you blame others, you say no accountability, but you know, if you're pointing the finger, if you're looking in the mirror, the finger's pointing back. So you know, how do we go about measuring that? I mean, self-assessment, those 360 degrees where managers are being managed. You know, there's ways to determine uh, leadership and, and passing the buck or blaming others. Yeah, you can also go to customer complaints, customer complaints, and also a lack of employee engagement. So all of those are really spiraling effects of um, bad bosses. Now, the next one, number five, is that Bad bosses have no strategy for success. Can you imagine working in a department where, um, you know, leaders feel that, well, you know, I didn't plan anything. Nobody planned for me. Nobody trained me. I turned out OK. <laughs> so I don't think that that's necessary. Just come and get the job done. But employees, if you want them to be engaged, they need to understand what's the strategy you know, the strategy for how are we going to attain the goals? Well, we don't even know what they are. And then bad bosses often wonder, why is everybody disengaged? Why is everybody demotivated? Why is employee turnover high? Why is morale low? It's because a lot of these things that we're talking about, they have rippling effects. Well, you talk about, yeah, employee turnover, or low morale, and you keep using the word employee engagement. Why aren't the employees engaged? Mm -hmm. Are they being praised? Are they being recognized? Because there's a fine line. We use the two R's being being recognized and also um, resigning from work. So mm -hmm. so so engagement is key in having a strategy in place to do that. It definitely is. And then if we move on to number six and seven, I'm just going to kind of cover those together. Bad bosses never delegate. They hold on to everything. They're territorial. Therefore, they don't challenge the team. They don't empower the team. The team cannot take on initiative because they don't know what to do. You know, there was a great book written a couple of years ago called The Flight of the Buffalo. And it asked, are you leading your team like a flight, like a herd of buffalo or like a flock of geese? And what you realize is that buffalo are very loyal to the leader. So they do exactly what the leader wants them to do. That's good. But what happens with the buffalo herd if that's your team, is that when you're not there, you've enabled them. So they depend on you for so much that if you're not there, it's chaos, it's pandemonium. They don't know what to do. So if you're on vacation, if you're sick, you're constantly getting calls because you didn't delegate, empower, and train your team so that they can take on some of those challenges and be able to work highly effectively in your absence. Well, and why, then, 
And not to cut ahead. you off, but I'm just going to interject. So why delegation goes both ways if you over delegate or not delegate, but why don't that sign of a bad boss, why don't they delegate? Is it an act of fear? Is it a control thing? You know, I mean, there's a lot of factors that come into play. What are your thoughts on that? It's both of those. That's an excellent question. It's both. Sometimes they are in fear that if I delegate, uh, it'll show me out. If I delegate, what's going to be left for me to do? All moronic <laughs> ways of thinking. What's going to be left for you to do? Think about the future, set goals, communicate, hold people accountable. All of those things you'll have more free time to do if you start to delegate. Now, I don't ever think you can over delegate. But sometimes delegation gets confused with dumping. If you ask or if you assign an employee a task, but you provide no training, no support, no communication on how to do it, you're just dumping a task on them because you don't feel like doing it or you're going on vacation and you don't have time. But true delegation is when you take the time to communicate, to make sure the employee understands exactly how to do the job and to set sex and to set them up for success so they know when I give you this task at the end of the road, here is what success will look like. Does that make sense? No, it's long range planning. It's not living in the now, but living in the future and making things happen. So no, it makes 100%. You're keeping it 100 with that. And then number seven is that bad bosses don't mentor. You know, they assume but that because they made it, made it through the management ranks without coaching and mentoring and training, that it's not necessary for their employees to have mentoring in order to grow. Again, it's just a silly way of thinking. You know, what happens is that your employees end up being resentful because they feel like you're trying to hold them back. They get these uh, senses um, and perceptions that really don't even exist. So mentoring, coaching, developing, and training your team is vitally important, and it's just something that bad bosses don't do. I also want to say this, too, is that when we say bad bosses don't delegate, another reason and they don't mentor, sometimes it's because they don't know how to. So we have to put that in the mix, too, is that a lot of times a person isn't a bad person. They just don't know how to do it. But there's well, lots of resources out there to learn. Yeah, and it comes to it comes into management development, or let's keep, let's say the keyword leadership development as a mm -hmm. manager. So we're gonna we're gonna change the table a little bit. We're gonna go and look at the the concept of effective leaders or effective leadership. Let's 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 talk about some of the traits of effective leaders. Yes, and I like to think of them as the top top ten characteristics of a leader who cares. And you know, this is built off of um, an employee engagement study that shows how do you create full employee engagement? Well, there are 10 things that a leader needs to be doing. And if you're doing these 10 things, then it demonstrates that you care. You see, often as leaders, we think they know I care. No, they don't. <laughs> you have to demonstrate it. It has to be more than just words. So let's go through these quickly. And there's 10 characteristics of a leader. They're not necessarily in any chronologic or any numeric order. They're all equally important. So let's start with number one. Leaders who care are generous with their knowledge and expertise. They regularly share insight with their team to ensure they grow into highly competent, highly effective leaders. Remember a moment ago, we were just saying that ineffective leaders or bad bosses don't mentor and they don't delegate. So in order to improve and be better, it's important that number one, that you are generous with your not with your knowledge, with your time, and also generous with praise and recognition for your employees. Praise and recognition, those are action items to engage your employees and leaders lead by doing that, being able to provide praise, um, direction, insight, which leads me to the number two on the list. I believe it's feedback. Exactly. And we're going to provide um, a link so that people can get the cheat sheet that we're speaking from because it's a lot of good information. Sometimes people try to take notes. And this is really good for anyone that's looking to strengthen their professional development. So number two, with leaders who care, a way to demonstrate it is to provide actionable feedback. Sometimes we're providing feedback that nobody can act on. It's kind of like oblivious generic feedback.
but leaders that provide actionable feedback means that they provide employees with tangible things that they can do to improve their performance. Actionable team feedback, excuse me, means that while you may be correcting someone for job performance deficiency, you do it in a way that is gracious and immediately provides them with the appropriate steps to improve and to excel. Now that takes time. Sometimes a leader just wants to, they want to get something off their chest because they're they're upset and frustrated because the employee did not meet their expectations. But it's important to step back and make sure that any feedback that you give is feedback that's tangible that they can actually use to improve. Having that actionable results and giving employee feedback so they can have results and, and accomplish goals, because if not, it's chaos. There's no sense of direction. Love it. Love it. Number three, leaders who care also value the perspective and insight that others bring to the table. And this is one where many employees will say, you know, I give ideas on how we can improve as a team and my leader never actually implements them. You know, it's kind of like, I'm just giving, so I don't give any feedback. I don't give any input on how we can be better. But a good leader values the input, they're collaborative. And if the input is something that will benefit the team and then be more successful, more effective, a leader puts it in place and makes sure that an employee gets that recognition. Yeah, recognition goes a long way and, and staying focused as a leader is the next topic on the list. So let's let's tackle that one right now. All right, so now we're at number four. Uh, a leader who cares is considerate of others, meaning that they are careful not to cause inconvenience or hurt to others on the team. They are thoughtful of others and would never do anything that would distress, disrespect, or cause harm to another worker. You know, when I ask leaders, explain or, or describe your communication skill. I always get this thing, I'm direct, I'm straightforward. And I do believe that as leaders that there should be a lot of clarity and we should be very concrete when we are um, explaining or sharing information or giving feedback. But we have to also balance the courage to give someone feedback that's constructive with consideration, empathy, and compassion. And that's really what that means. I got you. Let, let, what's next on your list here of uh, leadership positive traits All that, right, for leaders at, that care? <laughs> we're at number five. So let me just go back really quickly. You have to be generous in your knowledge. That's number one. Two, provide actionable feedback. Three, you have to value people's perspectives. Four, be considerate of, of others. And five is that you make sure that your team stays focused on delivering results. And that's that. Nothing has to be added to that. You know, bad bosses, when we go back to, they don't provide any goals. They don't communicate. They don't hold people accountable. Well, if you're not doing any of those, how on earth can you help your team be focused on delivering results? So a good leader who really cares is going to make sure that people stay focused on that. And you know what? It sounds like recognition is just resounding throughout our talk today. So in every aspect of this, recognition plays a vital element that when people are focused on the results and that when we do reach them, that we make sure that uh, they're recognized for that. Well, be focused and recognized, but recognition goes a long way with keeping employees engaged. It shows traits of a leader. So, I mean, it, it goes hand in hand. If you're not recognizing, you're not uh, acknowledging your employees, you're not showing a sense of uh, leadership or direction or emotional investment to your employees, then, then you may have a problem. Everybody wants to feel valued and that's really what recognition is all about. So let's move on to number six. Leaders who care constantly communicate clear goals. We just talked about how important that is. So I don't need to spend much time on that. But in the cheat sheet, it says they do this so there's no confusion on what's expected and everyone stays on task. So people need to know the goals and we need to make sure that we're communicating them regularly. In these sessions, we often talk about how you have to, how you have to uh, repeat something 21 times in order to form a habit. Well, the goals, the expectations, all of that has to be talked about over and over and over again so that it becomes second nature with our team. Have the goals and plan and, and, and keep it moving. Yes. And seven, 
leaders who care don't micromanage. And if you're generous in your knowledge and generous in your time and expertise, so you're training people, when you're giving people the right feedback, when you're showing them that you value their perspective, you're considerate, you're keeping them focused and you're creating clear goals, guess what? You don't have to micromanage because you've been repeating and demonstrating on a regular basis what is expected. It goes back to the seven signs of a bad boss you know, if you're if you fall prey to any of those seven things, guess what? You have to micromanage. <laughs> well, you have to micromanage or you don't have to micromanage, but it comes down to delegation and confidence in your employees. Because I like to use the phrase. This is my take in layman's terms. I like to use the phrase, you don't micromanage me, but micro support me when I need support. I like if you, that. If you, if you delegate, I think if you delegate too much, then there's a sense of. I may as an employee, maybe at law at a loss if I need help or assistance, but don't hit me with the mundane over and over again. Cause you didn't, the word is trust. What's the level of trust and support? Mm -hmm. Micromanagement gives me a, an impression is that you don't trust me, but I also need help. So I want to be supported. So I, I look at it at two different ways, two sides of the coin. I love that. And I'd like to also add, add that micromanagement is not bad when you're teaching someone or delegating something new that they've never done before. Then they need a lot of direction. And sometimes that can be perceived as micromanage. But if you're delegating something that the person's done before, they've proven that they're successful in it. You're absolutely right. If you're still micromanaging at that point, it's exhibiting distrust. So thank you for that. I love that. Let's move on into number eight, coming out on to the last couple of these characteristics of a leader that cares. Number eight is that leaders who care regularly share information from senior leadership, which means that when they come out of their senior leadership meeting, they make sure that that information trickles down to everybody so that there, again, is clarity around the corporate direction and how we fall into the picture and how we will contribute to the success of the overall um, organization. So often managers come out of their senior leadership meeting and they'll share anything. <laughs> right. So again, employees are in the dark. So it's just very important that that's done um, because it really helps employees see how the work that the hard work that they put in every day contributes to the overall success again of the organization. Any more uh, leadership traits for leaders that care? Two more. The next one is that leaders who care schedule quality time in the form of one-on-one -on -one meetings. And I can't tell you how invaluable quality time is. It could be one-on-one -on -one meetings. If you've got a large team, your one-on-one -on -one meetings might be once a quarter. If you're leading leaders, then I think that your one-on-one -on -one meetings need to be at least a couple of times a month. But a one-on-one -on -one meeting, the purpose is that is so that that employee gets quality time with you so they can update you on projects, so they can get um, insight from you on how to uh, overcome workplace challenges, to ensure that everybody's aligned with your expectations, and also to recognize the great things that they're doing that's helping the organization to continue to propel. So those one-on-one -on -one meetings are very important. And I just run into too many leaders that say they don't have them. They don't have time. Well, no wonder, again, employees are disengaged. No wonder they feel de devalued. They feel that you don't trust them. They feel that they want to leave. So retention is high. So those one-on-one -on -one meetings have tremendous um, impact. So if you make the time on the front end for one-on-one -on -one meetings, the impact at the end is tremendous. You got to create that culture of a workable culture where employees and management all are on the same page and continuous leadership development. And that comes down to talking and, and, and coaching and leading. Exactly. And one on one meetings, it's a good time to, to, to do a little professional development or leadership development. You know, one on one meeting can be 15 minutes one-on-one -on -one quality time with that employee. It could be 30 minutes. Sometimes it might be an hour, but the value of employees knowing that you care, and that is the number one way to show it, is that you spend some quality time with them on how you can help them to be successful in the workplace. 
And then the last one of the 10 characteristics of a leader who cares is that a leader who cares uses that quality time as an opportunity to have career development discussions with their team. So they know exactly what's required or so the person knows what's required for them to continue to grow professionally. Again, in my coaching sessions, when I ask executives and leaders, um, tell me about your team members and they'll give me strengths, weaknesses and so on. And I say, what's their career aspirations? They don't know. <laughs> they have no clue. Now, if the person's relatively new, that's understandable. But if someone's been in the organization for a year, two years or more, as a leader, it's incumbent that you know that. And it's okay if the employee says, I don't have any aspirations. I like what I do. I don't want to move. Fine. I just want to know. Or if they say, I want your job, Theo. I want to be you. Fine. I don't feel intimidated. I'll teach you everything that you can because the more that you empower, develop, and train your employees, the more free time you get to really be that visionary leader. I love it. And and just to kind of recap, I'll just put my spin on in layman's terms. Mm -hmm. And we talked about, you know, signs of a bad boss and then a how to show leadership for leaders that care. It really comes down to engaging your employees, having effective communication and having your goal, being on the same page of goals. You gotta, you gotta be on the same page. You've got to roll in the same direction, but you've got to make it, you got to empathize. You got to understand both the employees and managers perspective. It's mm -hmm. a continuing process when it comes to leadership as well as management, but engagement with your employees is necessary recognize praise if not they'll they'll resign and quit so yes at the same time it's a continual process leaders are always learning and always leading theo uh, you can add something to the recap but what else do you have going on before i get to what we got going on because we always have something going on here at performance solutions by design i love what you said so i want to leave people you know we've told them how to determine, do you fall prey to any of these signs of a bad boss? And if you do, how can you demonstrate that you care? I want to leave people with um, what they need to start, stop, and continue doing, because I love doing that, because then you have actionable things at the end of every session that you can go and apply immediately. So if you find that you have fallen prey to some of those seven signs of a bad boss and you want to be better, here are a couple of things you can start. Start communicating what you expect with your employees to ensure that they're clear of the goals, start having those regular one-on-ones because as we shared, there are a multitude of benefits to that and start holding your team accountable. What do we need to stop doing as leaders? Stop assuming that people know that you care. No, they don't. <laughs> and stop thinking um, that it takes too much time. It's not worth it. No, the more that you develop your team, the more time that you're gonna have. And here are a couple of things I want you to continue doing out there in podcast world. If you're a good leader or if you're stri striving to become even better, continue being that role model, continue uh, being focused on your team success and continue listening and learning. So with that said, I'd like to move on to uh, what we're doing. And I think we always talk about the fact and I love that we get some time to talk about what we've got going on. You know, we've been doing this executive coaching program called Unlocking Your Executive Leadership Potential now for about two years. We've had 40 people graduate for the program and it's had tremendous success. So we just started our next group. We have about 10 to 15 leaders per quarter. So we just started our next quarter in July. So we've got July, August, September. So the next group after that will be starting in October. But with this, it helps you to, it's one-on-one -on -one meetings with me. And then we have group sessions once a month. You get an unlimited coaching sessions with me where we talk about ways to strengthen executive presence, to improve your communication skills, ways to build accountability, to implement your vision for your team as a leader, to strengthen organizational culture, ways that you can make better decisions 
and ways that you can achieve quicker, more effective results. So that's kind of what we've got going on. I think that uh, at the end of this podcast also, I'll make sure that we have a link so that people can learn more. We've got a great landing page that talks a lot more about it. And if it's something that you're interested in, you can set up an informational call with me. So that's kind of what we got going on right now, Doug. What do you have going on? Still doing a lot of uh, production with videos. I've got the Outbound Sales Conference coming up in September, but really investing my time in learning more traits of effective leadership and communication. So that's why this topic here was on point with me because I'm learning how to lead and really how to plan a strategy. So, you know, it's, it's ironic when you do a project and you're learning from that project. So video production, conferences, of course, a lot of editing, but enough mm -hmm. about me. Anything else that, before we wrap this up that you want to add? Your parting shot. I, I just want people to remember, again, be generous with your time, communicate, recognize. Three things people never get enough of in the workplace is recognition, communication, and money. Nobody ever says, I don't want to raise this year. I've made enough. Now, as leaders, sometimes we can't really directly impact that to the level that we want. But two things that we can immediately impact is giving as much communication as possible and giving as much recognition as warranted. And that's even recognizing people for some of the small things, too. So, Doug, thank you so much for your time. Hopefully people will find benefit in what we talked about today. And I'm looking forward to the next topic because we get these from suggestions that I get through my executive coaching. Uh, that's how we kind of determine what we're going to talk to ne talk about next. Yeah, I love that. We like to hear input and insight because normally we were touching on the customer experience, how customers and how to deliver a you know, better experience with your clients and customers. Today, we want to spin it up a little bit and talk from executive coaching perspective, looking within your own company and organizations, whether it's management, leading, and employee satisfaction, customer engagement. That's where we really hit home. Well, Theo, it was a pleasure talking to you. And until next time, we cover more topics. The world of executive coaching, whether it's customer experience, employee engagement. The key word is engagement. And I want to thank our viewers out there and our listeners out there for taking time. And you're always welcome for feedback and topics that we want to discuss. I'm Doug with Theo Gilbert Jameson. Until next time.